Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike, and this is the show where we break down the lessons we can learn as DMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 21 of the Vox Machina campaign, Trial of the Take, Part 4. Reminder, Will Whedon and Will Friedle are joining the cast as guest stars, helping Vax, Tiberius, and Keyleth hunt a Rakshasa in the crypts beneath Vasselheim. As the episode opens, Tiberius, Cashaw, and Keyleth are at the bottom of a cistern full of the city's refuse, as a tentacled monster bursts out of the muck. For those unfamiliar, this is an Atiug, a monster that literally just lives in garbage waiting for prey. Seriously, that's their whole vibe and the lore. Also, apparently they're sentient? They speak a language called Atiug, and they communicate with other creatures telepathically? This doesn't come up in the episode, and I didn't know that until I pulled up the creature's stats to reference for this video, but I've had the monster manual for eight years, and I've never noticed this? Wild. Anyway, it's initiative against an Atiug and a bunch of rat swarms, so here's some highlights. Tiberius uses a bunch of sorcerer points to deal more than 70 damage to the Atiug, he quickens a spell and empowers both spells, and listen, I genuinely have no idea if this is how the rules work, I'm pretty sure it's not, but this was 8 years ago, and we don't gain a ton by pointing that out every time Tiberius casts a spell. I mean, I guess here's a lesson, don't use sorcerer points when you shouldn't be able to, unless the DM says it's okay. Nobody needed me to say that, but people keep bringing it up in every one of these videos where Tiberius makes any appearance or casts anything with his Sorcerer Points, so you know what? Hey, I've said it. Also, on his next turn, he uses Sorcerer Points to quicken another spell and cast it as a bonus action, but the spell he casts is Misty Step, which is already a bonus action, so he didn't actually need to do that. Does that wash out and equalize the other Sorcerer Points he shouldn't have been able to cast to do the spells that he was able to do? Honestly, I don't know. I'm not keeping track of the Sorcerer Points. It really doesn't matter to me. It's been eight years. It mattered a lot in 2015. It does not matter now. What really matters about the Sorcerer Points is what happens later in this episode, and we'll get there. Because Vax and Torbier were so far away when the fight started, they don't really get to help. Keyleth kills the Atyug with a couple of Blight spells, but Thorbeer gets there just in time to slay some rats. I mean... He's got three attacks, so he must be able to help, right? Well, Will Whedon rolls a two, a three. He's getting warmed up! <laughs> and a one. No! This can't be real! It's astonishing. But truthfully, Will is a good sport about it. He plays along. He understands that when Torbeer rolls something shockingly low, well, maybe not shocking, but unlikely weirdly low, it's comical and kind of pathetic, so he does what makes the most sense. He, as a player, revels in his failure, but his character acts like a proud warrior. When he rolls a 1, Matt describes a rat climbing into Torbeer's codpiece and biting him where the sun don't shine. But when Vax snipes the rats around him, Torbeer bellows, I was doing fine. Obviously, he was not. But that's because Will is a good sport. He knows there's the irony of the character feeling proud and being ineffectual. It helps that he's a guest star. At the top of the episode, he literally said he was planning to sacrifice himself dramatically to save one of the players before the session ended, at some point. It's a joke, but it speaks to a kernel of truth. He knows he's here for a good time, not a long time. In his goal to kill some rats, Tiberius casts Obelisk of Stone, just so he can raise himself far enough to cast Firebolt on the rats without being at disadvantage by quickening the spell. I really am not trying to pile onto this one player, but this context matters. The last of the rats retreats, and we're out of initiative. Vax picks a lock in a door, and they escape the cistern and enter a hallway, with jail cells on either side, and a few of these cells contain skeletons. They are in the lowest forgotten levels of the Amaranthine Oubliette, the jail, the prison I guess is the better term, for Vasselheim. As they enter this area, Matt tells them they smell an acrid scent. Aside from this area smelling dusty, there's also a chemical smell in the air that's hard to describe. Keyleth finds a cell with a fresh corpse inside, not a skeleton, and Vax pops the lock. He rolls a natural 20, and Matt rewards this by saying that something had been broken off inside the lock, probably part of a key, whether accidentally or on purpose, he couldn't tell, and describes that Vax somehow managed to get that tiny piece of metal out and pick the lock. It's just a nice way to make sure that the natural 20 feels impressive. Matt is really good at this whenever Vax rolls a natural 20 to pick locks. There's a few great ones I'm thinking of that we'll get to another day. 
The body they find has been torn open. It's the body of a Dusk Meadow Bastion, one of the volunteer guards of the city. And then, without missing a beat, okay, I'd like to cast speak with the dead. You can. Motherfucking yeah. clerics. Find out what killed him. God, I love Cashaw. I love when new players find tabletop RPGs. It's so wonderful. They learn that a woman killed this bastion, apparently with her teeth, and then walked away laughing, and that was 14 weeks ago. Sometimes a dwarf would also pass and also laughed. Now, technically, rules is written. The guard shouldn't know any of the stuff that happened since he died. He shouldn't know about the dwarf passing every once in a while. And when one of Matt's regular players gets access to the spell, he'll know those rules a little bit better. But right now, he's got less than three hours to resolve this entire adventure, so I suspect he just didn't bother taking the time to fully read the spell. And honestly, who cares? It's cool. It makes Cash Off feel cool. It gives them the information they need. It works. They ask their questions and then the spell fades. We also learn some of Kashaw's backstory. My god is called Vesh, and I am the only one on the planet who has ever heard of her. Oh. And uh, she killed everybody else. You wanna talk to her? I mean, I don't. No, neither do I. Why did she spare you? Because I'm her husband. She married me at birth. My uh, mother was told that I was a special child, which is why I had the yellow eyes. I had two when I was born. We were married at birth. She killed everyone in the village. On my 15th naming day, she came to consummate the marriage. I made the first 50 slashes on my right arm. She made the next 50 for a ritual called the Sting of the Hundred. When my blood mixed with her sweat, I gained all her memories. That's when I found out she was essentially the devil. I was raised as a healer because I wasn't just supposed to be her husband, but also her balance, because the universe couldn't accept somebody as black as her in it. I tried to kill her at 15. I haven't seen her since. So it's not like you could ask for a favor, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose I could, but there's a good chance she'll kill you, me, and everyone around at the same time. I love how casually this information is presented. It's maybe my favorite part of it. As far as I know, Will Friedle made up this lore on his own without Matt's help or prompting. This is just the character he made. Also, this doesn't really tie too much into this moment in the episode, but since we're talking about Cash, there is a great running joke between Cashaw and Tiberius where Cash can't remember Tiberius' last name. Instead of Stormwind, he keeps calling him Stormcloud or Storm Shadow or Storm Chaser, all sorts of things. In the previous episode, Will Friedle made it very clear that these are not deliberate nicknames on Cash's part, his character just keeps getting it wrong. This is probably a choice because Cash has such a terrible charisma role. It's delightful. Cash is the best. A pair of guards approach the area. This area is patrolled very occasionally, but the party got unlucky and arrived during one of those patrols, because it's more dramatic. The party hides in a cell as the guards pass, and as the guards enter the next chamber, where they are in between the party and the cistern, Keyleth casts a wall of stone and closes them in. But before our heroes can get through the next door, the temperature drops, a very cool environmental detail and a bit of very brief foreshadowing, and two ghosts enter the hallway. And it's initiative, so here are the highlights. Well, if we want to call them that. Vax and Keyleth get possessed by the ghosts. Wilfredell, being a new player, doesn't realize he has the perfect tool for this encounter, turn undead. Matt tries to hint at this without telling Wilfredell what to do, saying he has tools against undead, but he doesn't want to rob Will's agency as a player. He doesn't want to tell him what he should be doing. So, without knowing that Cashaw has that option, the party's plan is to wail on Vax and Keyleth until the ghosts leave. And Vax and Keyleth are just rolling physical attacks against their friends whenever their DM tells them to, and they don't get to make any saves against being possessed. After Cashaw's first round, Matt starts dropping big hints. Spells won't affect the ghosts inside them unless it's a ritual that forces undead away. He reminds Tiberius that he's seen Pike do something that made undead run away. But Tiberius doesn't pick up on what Matt's trying to do, or maybe he just thinks Matt's talking about the Mace of Disruption. Either way, he casts Obelisks of Stone to do damage to Vax and Keyleth, and knocks Keyleth unconscious. As the ghost leaves her body, Tiberius quickens a spell to blast the ghost with Firebolt, which, honestly, that's the best use of Sorcerer Points in this entire episode. It's the one time that makes a lot of sense, and it is a really smart, 
tactical decision to try to hit that ghost before it can potentially go into somebody else's body. This is the one where it actually makes a lot of sense. Now that ghost doesn't recharge its ability to possess people on this turn, so instead it casts out a fear effect, which means Cashaw, who fails the save, can't get closer to the ghost. Everyone's having a great time. Mechanics where the players don't get to do anything are just so much fun. Vax stabs Tiberius, and here's where Tiberius sort of discovers that his circlet doesn't do what he thought it does. He can have two concentration spells at once, but the older spell only lasts for two rounds, and one of the spells he has up is Stone Skin, which reduces the damage. However, because this is the second round, he technically does have both spells going, and actually, Vax's daggers bypass Stone Skin because they're magical. Either way, it means this lesson isn't actually going to click in until it comes up in another five episodes, because that's actually a really important lesson here. Sometimes you tell the players how a rule is supposed to work, but because it doesn't actually apply to them because of the circumstances, in this moment, the player isn't actually doing anything wrong. Well, they did actually misunderstand the rule, it just doesn't affect what they would have done this turn. Well, when that happens, the thing you tell them about the rules doesn't sink in. That's actually just true about life in general, come to think of it. Torbeer unloads some damage on Vax to try to draw his, well, the ghost's attention to him. He's a battle master. He can do these things. He can basically goad the ghost to target him instead of anybody else. But during these attacks, he rolls another one. Because, of course. Cashaw blesses the remaining party members and then shrugs off the fear with an extremely good roll, a save at the end of his turn. And Matt uses this opportunity to narratively justify Cash no longer being afraid by reminding him undead should fear him, and he can make that a reality by using Turn Undead. On his next turn, Cash casts Turn Undead, or channels it, what's the right term? Anyway, the spirit is forced out of Vax, but Keyleth is down two death saves, so Tiberius feeds her a potion. And the spirits retreat, so we are out of initiative. Vax keeps staggering forward despite the others insisting that he wait. He just keeps chugging healing potions and scouting the next room, which is a hallway full of acid. Okay, some context here. For a few years, Will Wheaton was a member of the Acquisitions Incorporated actual play shows. And big spoilers here for a 14-year-old game of D&D, his second adventure with the group in the third season of Acquisitions Incorporated, his character fell into a vat of acid and got dissolved. Now he came back in the next session, it is still D&D, but that was a bit of a sore spot for Will, as I'm sure you could imagine. Anyway, when this part of the map is revealed, Will looks at it like he is trying to burn a hole through it with his eyes. I once knew someone who met a bad fate in acid. I would prefer to not encounter it myself. Yes, I agree. <laughs> he was a good man. I heard he was brave, very brave. I never heard about this. How did you hear about this? It was a good man who was murdered by the gods. It is legend. The acid guy is legend. Yes. All right. Yes. Yet, oddly, I still think he's the player having the most fun right now. Actually, Wilfred L just made a bunch of ghosts go away. He dropped details about his awesome backstory, and his dynamic with Keyleth is getting progressively more flirtatious. He's having the best game of the night. Oh, you scared them with positive energy? Unfortunately, the only kind of energy I'm allowed to use most of the time. You told me ironic when I That's picked amazing. up that guy. That's amazing. How much money supply? you got? Like three k, I think. Three k? You said you were single. Keyleth casts Hero's Feast, and Matt has her retroactively deduct one thousand gold for the material component required for that spell. And this happens the first few times the party casts this spell during the campaign. I don't remember yet when Matt starts being a bit more strict about the party telling him in advance when they are buying the spell component, rather than uh, having them deduct the gold retroactively. But he gives them some latitude early on. Remember, this is still a pretty new system, not just for the cast, but for the community at large. And honestly, I wonder how often Matt's other games ever got to this high level in any edition. So he's probably just happy to be playing with characters who have hit the double digits. Statistically, not many games get this far. So if he has to do a bit of hand-waving as they get used to things, it's worth it, because they're doing something that most D&D players and DMs never get a chance to do. They're doing higher level play. The group takes a short rest, and at first, Orion is very clear that Tiberius wants a long rest. He is all out of his resources, and Cashaw is also down a few higher level spells. That's another argument that Tiberius makes. 
And as Tiberius points out, they have two and a half days left to catch the creature. This window is still wide enough that they could conceivably rest. Cash is not as firmly dedicated to the idea of a long rest, although it does sound like he would appreciate it. It's time or it's strength. That's, that's what we're talking about. We wait and we go in fully charged. Or we go now, and we have a much better chance of catching up to it, but weakened. But Vax and Torbeer are pretty firm that their quarry will get away, fully escape, if they leave right now to go and rest. Tiberius, more quickly than I remembered, just clarifies and states his case and then leaves it to the group. And honestly, that's the most mature way to handle the situation. Yes, he's the one who burned all of his sorcerer points, and he shouldn't have done that. And yeah, it's a bummer that if they push forward, he is probably going to be a lot less useful than he could have been in the final fight. He got to cast two spells every turn through all these smaller encounters, and now he's relatively burnt out. And he's probably pretty bitter about it. In fact, his frustration will be visible more than once later in the episode. And honestly, while it's never fun to watch people having a bad time, you are allowed to have bad games sometimes. It happens. Vax and Keyleth just got to do nothing for an entire fight beside roll damage on their friends and watch their hit points tick down. It happens. But then Tiberius and Kasha leave the decision to the group. That was the mature decision. That's how you do it. And yeah, as I alluded to, Tiberius slash Orion still makes some comments through later parts of the episode. He's still frustrated, which isn't fun to watch, and it's probably not fun for him either. But he's also trying, which I do appreciate. He's also playing along with the jokes. Whenever things are tense and somebody tries to lighten the mood, he joins in. When Vax makes callbacks to a terrible alias Tiberius used in Craghammer, Orion laughs. Again, it's not perfect. It would obviously be better if he wasn't holding onto that frustration at all. But that's not always an option. When you're having a bad game, sometimes you just need to compartmentalize. Be frustrated, sure, but remember it's a game and you're still with your friends. I didn't go into this episode intending to defend Tiberius. I always remember this episode as actually being pretty miserable to watch. And maybe it is if you haven't experienced it before. But rewatching, it's clear that the misery is coming from a lot of factors, not just Tiberius' attitude. And honestly, his attitude is a bummer, but he's not doing anything specific in this game that I would call out as a problem. If this game session played out at my table, I probably wouldn't end up pulling anybody aside for a stern talking to. They're just frustrated, they're just having a bad time for a lot of reasons. This isn't like episode 13, for example, when he literally silences people so that he can talk over them. Now, it still is not a fun episode to watch, but in this case, he's actually doing a little bit of what I wish he'd done a lot more of back in episode 11. It's not perfect, but it is still, surprisingly, progress. The party resolves to fly across the acid pool on the flying carpet, because remember, breaking with tradition, they have it in Tiberius's bag of holding instead of Grog's. And because they're traveling with only the size of a, you know, like a regular D&D party, not eight people, they all fit on the flying carpet. <laughs> what a nice change of pace. And then, halfway across, a pair of runes in the walls flash with magic energy. And then the carpet drops out of the air toward the acid. Tiberius casts fly on the group, and it works for a moment, but then it stops working, thanks to those sigils on the wall. Torbir and Tiberius are able to land on a platform of solid stone in the middle of the acid pool, Keyleth becomes a giant eagle, and Vax and Cash roll low and they wind up in the acid. Keyleth fishes out Cash, and at Vax's and Keyleth's urging, Cash pulls the carpet out with him, but the acid is still slowly burning away at the carpet. Keyleth starts pulling the other members to safety, starting with Tiberius, who has to act quickly using his mending wheel, his magic item, to save the flying carpet before the enchantment fades. He uses the mending wheel, and the carpet is restored to being intact. But the magic is gone. But hey, Torbeer didn't take any acid damage. That was nice. This is when the attitude of the party gets really... cruddy. Vax and Keyleth are mourning the carpet, and moreover, dreading the reaction when Vex finds out. Because by the way, some of the other cast members are watching in the other room, and on about a 15 second delay, we hear them cry out in anguish as they find out the carpet isn't magical anymore. Vex is gonna kill us. Yeah. Who's that? My sister. Oh wow. god, we just heard them scream from the other room. <laughs> oh my god. Hmm. Hmm. 
delay. They just saw it. <laughs> Yikes. Tiberius is pissed about this whole situation. He says at one point, this is a death march. With all of the resources they've spent and or with their escape route now cut off without the flying carpet, it seems, on a rewatch at least, like Tiberius is convinced they're going to die. But also, if they do make it out, he does say they can just enchant the carpet again. After all, he has crafted many magic items for the party, so from his perspective, there's no point in mourning the carpet. And Cashaw and Torbeer, who do not care about this carpet, are just trying to rally Vax and Keyleth to focus on pushing forward. Again, for a lot of reasons, some people just are not having fun in this game. The party passes through a hidden door at the end of the hall and enters a chamber with a huge statue of the archdevil Dispater, patron of politicians and deception. And this statue is weeping acid. That's where the acid in the other room came from. It had eaten through the walls and crept into a storage hallway. Vax stealths, Tiberius turns invisible, and then they hear a voice, the Rakshasa, who asks, I ask you all this question. Why do you hunt Hortis? This is something I've touched on before, and I will highlight it again in future episodes, but Matt is really good at making sure the villains' names are exposed to the party. I'm terrible at this in my own games. So many of my villains have been metaphorically buried in unmarked graves because their names never got revealed to the party. Because I didn't do this. The party answers that they are here fulfilling a contract, and Hotis, who perhaps takes a little bit of inspiration from the specific archdevil depicted in the statue, offers to make a new deal, where they walk away and he gives them some work at some point later down the road. I'd like to make an insight check and see if I can just get a sense of how confident Go for he feels. I want to know everything about him. I want to know his parents' name. I want to know his social security number. I want to know what his bank account balance is. And I want to know his Ashley Madison password. <laughs> and Matt rewards this natural 20 and says that Torbier catches a hint of fear behind the fancy words and does not detect any intent to follow through on any deal they make. So the party agrees that they still have to slay Hodus, and Keyleth sees an amulet vanish from around this statue of Dispater's neck. And it's initiative, so here are the highlights. First of all, the energy in the room, the real room, the room of the players, improves a bit. They have an enemy. They are at the end of their journey. And honestly, the fact that Matt describes the creature as feeling some level of fear probably helped as well. Will rolls a one on his initiative. Did you think I meant Will Friedel? I did not. Before anything else happens, the Rakshasa appears and casts a spell on Tiberius, apparently ignoring Tiberius' invisibility, but Tiberius counterspells him. Tiberius still seems to have a lot of spells. I think he only used up a lot of his sorcerer points, but as it turns out, he still has a lot left in his chamber. Not really sure why he was so frustrated. Oh, it doesn't really matter. A suit of armor in the room comes to life. It actually looks like this. That's probably fine. All the normal mundane things have specific artwork from the monster manual. This thing casts a fireball at the party, but as it does so, Hotis mirrors its movements, giving it direction. Will rolls yet another one on a saving throw. It's... it's outrageous. Keyleth casts Fairy Fire, but it has no effect on the Rakshasa. He is still invisible. Tiberius seems to have deduced that their magic is going to be pretty much useless against him, but he still tries to cast Slow on both enemies. My guess is that he seems to have concluded that damage spells don't affect Hotis. That's why he tries to cast slow instead. But that conclusion is not quite accurate. Still, he slows the shield guardian, that's what that thing is called, by the way, and they learn from Matt that this shield guardian absorbs damage dealt to Hotis. They share damage. It also repairs itself. Torbeer gets three hits on the shield guardian. Of course, he took six attacks thanks to his action surge, and if you're wondering if you rolled a one on one of those attacks, why would you wonder that? You know the answer. You know what one of those results was. Why did you ask? Hodus takes control of Vax's mind, and yet again, twice in the same session, and Vax shanks the hell out of Kashaw before regaining control of his own body. That was my life-stealing dagger, and on a natural 20, 
uh, I get the 10 hit points that I cut from him. Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever I get, I guess. No, I get it. So I get one. Do it without the smile. Do it without the little smile. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't cut anything <laughs> just, today. Just do it without the tiny little smile. I'll take the 19 plus his 21. You've resisted the effect, domination, phase. <laughs> oh man, I me. feel so bad about that. You don't. I don't buy that face at all. I don't buy it at all. As far as my memory serves for what we've watched together, this is the first time Matt has a villain specifically target the cleric because it makes the most tactical sense. It will not be the last. Tiberius also tries to counterspell the mind control after Vax failed the roll, but Vax says it's too late. And when Will Wheaton points out that they are on the same team, why not just let him help? Vax, well, Liam, says that he's trying to break their sorcerer's bad habits. I mean, he's not wrong. As Keyleth takes her tiger form and attacks Hotus, Matt asks two important questions as she deals some damage. One, are her attacks considered magical? Which, yes, they are. She's Circle of the Moon, so she bypasses some of his damage resistance. And two, what is her alignment? She's neutral good. And so her bite tears out a good chunk of Hodus's flesh and deals a lot more damage than she expected. Interesting. So let's pull back the curtain because Matt is being very good at keeping in mind what makes Hodus, what makes a Rakshasa, special in battle. Because Rakshasas don't resist certain spells, that's not exactly it, he can't be affected or detected by spells of 6th level or lower. So also, yeah, technically Locate Creature shouldn't have worked in the last episode. Oh well. Again, it got them where they needed to be. They really only had a short window to do any of this adventure, so I think Matt just didn't mind. Or maybe he forgot. In regards to damage, Hotus is vulnerable to piercing damage from magic weapons wielded by good creatures. And speaking of, hey, you know what would suck for Hotus? If the rogue who got sneak attack with his magical dagger was also good aligned. And so that damage was doubled to... 76 damage in a single strike? Jesus. Matt realizes partway during the fight that for several episodes now, they've been resolving obelisks of stone wrong, and so somebody doesn't take damage when they make the save. They should be totally fine. But again, in this episode, I'm impressed. Orion just moves on. He accepts it and moves on. This, this is how things should be. You don't always have to be happy about it, but just accept the rulings and move on with the game. This episode is really not as bad as I remembered. But then Hotus promises to exact vengeance on all their loved ones, threatening their parents, Vax's sister, Torbir's daughter. And he's about to teleport away, but Tiberius tries to counterspell it. First, there's a little bit of confusion about how a magic item works, but when he eventually finally understands, realizes that his magic item will not allow him to cast counterspell, he goes ahead and spends his own counterspell at fourth level. And then, on a whim, changes his mind and casts Counterspell at the highest level he has, level 6. Which, aside from some ironic parallels to one of the biggest boss fights later in the campaign, which I won't say anything more about, also happens to be the level he needs to get through Hotus' magical resistance. But since Teleport is a 7th level spell, he still has to roll. We do get a little dice moment, I'm not going to linger on for too long, but I'm going to address where he rolls and then Matt tells him not to roll yet, and so he just scoops up the die and withdraws it, and he and Will Friedle laugh about it. But honestly, Matt then gives him advantage because Tiberius was prepared for exactly the situation, so the next roll was a 19. So I guess, honestly, if he hadn't pulled back the first roll, it wouldn't have mattered, but I personally would argue this probably is dice fudging. When something like this happens at your table, just make sure the DM knows that you already rolled and let them decide whether you should re-roll or not. It's it's just more polite. And because of that counterspell, Hotus is unable to teleport away. So now he looks genuinely scared. He starts flying toward the door, but Vax gets another hit, with another sneak attack, and sinks a blade into the base of Hotus's skull. Hotus drops to the ground, grab it by the ear, and <laughs> lift its head back. Talk about my sister again. <laughs> With a spray of crimson across the ground, this horrible sucking sound, you pull back the head as the life force of the Rakshasa comes spraying across the stone floor as you release it and leave it to the ground with the last bit of life left in its body as it, as it slowly flees its form. You hear this chuckle. I'll find you. That's probably fine. Then Vax kicks it into the acid and everybody screams and fishes the body out since they actually do need the Rakshasa's body parts for the contract. But you know what? It was pretty badass. Keyleth uses her herbalism book she bought from Gilmore to harvest these body parts and rolls 
two natural 20s in a row. That's pretty neat. Can I try and harvest some of the blood as well to that's, keep for personal use? Yeah, that's exactly what oh. I was going to do. For the lot. I'm, oh. I'm, taking, I'm taking some of the blood for sure. I'm feeling bad. Oh. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm a healer. I'm a healer. It, it's it's a little difficult. Since... They complete the contract and return to the Velvet Cabaret on their way up from the dungeon, just walking through covered in blood and acid burns. Not a care in the world. In my head, ain't no rest for the wicked. Plays in the background. They return to the guild hall for the Slayer's take and get paid for their contract. Cashaw doesn't take his share of the bounty. He divides it up among the rest of the party. It sounds like he had another obligation here, much like Vox Machina did, and he isn't much interested in sticking around with the Slayer's take. Then he calls Keyleth annoying, grabs her around the waist, and kisses her. It is, of course, just the kind of romantic moment a lot of us grew up with in the 80s and 90s movies. Which is to say, the consent angle is pretty dubious. A slight spoiler is ahead for later in the campaign, but Cashaw will return, and when he does, he apologizes. Not for kissing Keyleth, he doesn't regret that, but for stealing the kiss. Let's just say it seems like at some point after this episode, Cashaw and or Wilfred L. realize that while well, it's very cinematic to kiss somebody without warning, that doesn't actually make it kosher. People should know when you're going to kiss them, that's actually pretty important. Now again, nobody here is the bad guy. The cast doesn't have an issue with this behavior. This isn't an it's what my character would do moment that causes any issues or friction. It doesn't seem to bother Marisha. It doesn't really seem to bother Keyleth at all. I'm just pointing it out because this is like a huge systemic issue in our world and in our culture, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out that, yeah, some of the behavior that was normalized for us as men growing up based on the media we absorbed is not actually something that we should model. And Will Friedle is not the bad guy here. He becomes aware of this. It either occurs to him or somebody points it out, so the next time he appears on the show, he addresses it and acknowledges it as a mistake. Again, healthy communication. You'd be surprised how often it is the solution to all the problems that adults have with each other. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back soon with episode 22, Aramente de Pyra, a one-off quest and a Keyleth-centric episode. I remember liking this one. It also has one of the truly underrated improvised NPCs. That character is just so good. If you want to support the channel, there are a few ways you can do so. You can subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about new videos as soon as they come out, which is usually every Monday and Thursday. You can support me financially on Patreon. Any dollar amount really helps this show. My goal is someday to take this Critical Role Demystified series weekly, and so the more patrons we get, the closer that comes to becoming a real possibility. You can join my Discord server to be part of a cool community of people who are passionate about RPGs and putting together games. And you can sign up for my newsletter for updates about what I've got going on. If you're new to Critical Role and curious about where to start watching the live streams, click this video to get some details about their current campaign. That could be a really great place to start. Until next time, play fair and have fun.